You're listening to the Common Fan Podcast, a Husker football podcast for the common fan by the common fan. Welcome back to the Common Fan Podcast. I am TJ Burkle, as always, alongside Maddie Owens, Sr. and Geoff in Lincoln. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash at Common Fan GBR. So you can keep up with all the fun, frivolity, and Husker football obsessing right along with the Common Fans. You can also find us on all the major podcast platforms. Hey, Common Fans, it's almost the weekend, so make sure you're stocked up on Nebraska's own certified Piedmontese beef. This premium product is raised and grazed in the Nebraska Sandhills, and it is top-notch, Common Fans. Visit your local Mercado Butcher Shop, 30th and Yankee Hill, or 84th and Havelock in Lincoln, and 162nd and Maple in Omaha. You can also check out cpbeef.com to get high-quality, Certified Piedmontese beef products ship right to your front door anywhere across all 50 states. It's all delicious, common fans. You can't go wrong. Get to your local Mercado Butcher Shop or visit cpbeef.com. Certified Piedmontese, powering the Husker football team and powering the Common Fan Podcast. Our next guest is in his 40th year covering Husker athletics. He has written and edited a dozen books, all of which were about Nebraska football, except for one, which was about Nebraska basketball. He previously wrote for the Lincoln Journal Star, as well as Husker Illustrated. We are talking about the legendary Mike Babcock. Mike, thank you so much for joining the Common Fans today. Uh, I appreciate it. You know, it's uh, actually my 47th year it will be covering Husker football. And uh, legend is not true, but old is true. So um, let's <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my Google searching was a little bit inaccurate, but uh, 47 <laughs> sounds 47 sounds even cooler. You, yeah, it I does. Mean, you got it. Yeah. You, you got to get to 50 at this point, right? This, yeah. Is, this, yeah. this is episode number 40 of the podcast, however. So I could see how those numbers transposed. Yeah, they just got conflated in my head, I guess. So, so Mike, I, you know, I remember, you know, we remember very well, you know, growing up, reading the Lincoln Journal Star, you were always a staple of, of the Husker coverage. You know, what, what, what are you doing now uh, in the, these days of, of all the different sort of media outlets that are out there? What, how, what, what are you doing and on behalf of whom are you covering the Huskers? Uh, for her at sports slash Hale Varsity, I do a couple of times a week newsletter, email newsletter. Oh, cool. Um, which... You can sign up for free. Um, give me your email address, and I'll, I'll, uh, or send me your email address, and I'll put you on the list. It's it's free. Which is yeah. Where, where can work. where can where can common? Is there a website or something common fans can go to to sign up for your newsletter? Um, probably the easiest thing that there is. I'm not sure what it's called. This is how in touch I am with it. Um, <laughs> the best thing would be to uh, it's. Uh, Mike B at herdatsports.com. Okay. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I'll get you, I'll get you on the list again. It's free. So, okay. That's awesome. All right. Can we put out the word to the common fan listeners? They can email you Mike B at herdatsports.com and get added to the list. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fine. And I'll make sure that it happens. All right. Beautiful. All right. Awesome. Is good. Just one, one more, one more avenue to feed the addiction. Common fans, Mike B at her, that's h u r r d a t sports dot com. Yeah. Email the inestimable Mike Babcock, and he will put you on his list for his newsletter. And uh, and it just one more way to uh, to uh, obsess over the Huskers. That's awesome. Thank you, Mike. We're gonna. I, I can tell you, at least three of us are gonna take you up on that. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> So, Mike, in, in 47 years, geez, that goes back. Is that uh, – I don't do math very well. Early Osborne era, does that – does that that doesn't quite get back to the Devaney era. Yeah, that? my first season was 1978. So, it was – it was uh, – Okay. Uh, what, that was Tom's, what, sixth season? So – Yep. Um, and uh, so, I covered, uh, covered Tom uh, 
through the national championships, um, through the 94 national championship uh, at the Lincoln Journal and Star, and then Huskers Illustrated until um, we started up uh, Hale Varsity in, uh, uh, I think it was uh, 2011. Um, okay. And then Hale Varsity kind of, uh, the magazine uh, went away last May and uh, and now it's uh, online stuff with her at sports. But uh, I still well, have as sports slash Hale Varsity on the newsletter. Okay, cool. As as common fans know, I married an Oregon girl. I was born and raised in Lincoln, but I actually live in Bend, Oregon now. Um, but I had the uh, I had the Hale Varsity hard copy magazine come into my house in Bend, Oregon for for several years. So so um, lo love that and 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 still miss it. Um, you know, you you've seen a lot, Mike, and we're excited to get into some of your so, some of your Husker memories. I'm kind of curious, you know, you go back to TO's early days. Um, I'm I'm curious. You've you've seen all these coaches. You've seen the highs and the lows more recently of Husker football. Um, what sticks out about Matt Rule? Like, what have you what have you observed with the context of, you know, I'm sure you knew or observed Bob Devaney. You covered all to and every coach since you know what what have you observed about you know matt rule now that he's a year and a half into the job you know i like his attention to detail and, and i like the way he approaches things from the standpoint of it seems fairly open like he media access is is pretty good and in this day and age that's saying something because there are so many uh, media outlets represented at the, at the uh, uh, media availabilities. Um, and when you compare it to what it was when I started at the newspaper covering Tom Osborne, um, you'd go to practice, you'd go to practice every day, post-practice. And, uh, you know, there would be a handful of reporters there, you know, maybe one or two of us from the Lincoln Journal and Star, maybe one or two from the Omaha World Herald, and then maybe a, a TV station or two would show up on a daily basis. So in that situation, Tom got to know everybody. I mean, he knew the people that were that were covering him. Um, he knew how they did things. And it was on a personal basis, one to one. I mean, he might take you aside and say, hey, um, you know, I want to talk to you about such and such or whatever. Um, now I got a story about that. But I, but with with Matt Rule, you know, there are so many people, you know, he can't know all of those people. Um, and it, it makes it much more difficult with social media. You have to be careful, I guess, what you say, because it can go all over the place in social media. And if it comes out wrong, um, it reflects poorly on you. But it doesn't seem to be a problem with him. I like the fact that he is at all kinds of events uh, supporting other sports. I think that's important. I like the fact that they do the uh, the competition on the team uh, where points are scored for doing things outside of the, you know, off the practice field, going to other events, uh, going to schools in the in the community, that kind of thing. I like all that. He's, he's very much a part of the community. And as he told us the other day, um, after the you know, confusion, I guess, about the uh, athletic director, about Trev Alberts leaving. Um, he said, no, we're here. Uh, his wife is opening up a business here. Um, that's how committed I think they are. So uh, he's very much a part of the community. You've been able to see him out and about in the community at restaurants and whatever. Um, I like that. I like all of that because it it's, I think it's important to establish that connection with the community. And I think that, uh, you know, now it becomes a factor. Um, just win, baby. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. um, that's where it ultimately comes down to. But the way he's approached things, uh, I, I really like it. I really like his his uh, his attitude. Yeah, and you, you're 100 percent correct there, Mike. I mean, win or lose, you can't fault him for. Uh, showing his commitment to the program and just like you said, doing the right thing and um, you know showing that he's committed and being present on social media, going to all those uh, different events. So uh, uh, team rule here, we're all on board with him, obviously. 
Um, if we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into just the team itself, um, just in terms of offense, um, if Nebraska is going to take a step forward in 2024, um, the offense just it has to get better. Um, we saw what they were kind of capable of last year, but we were also seeing some of the things that they're, they weren't really capable of. Um, with Dylan being on campus now, um, Glenn Thomas is our co-offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. Um, there's been an infusion of talent through the transfer portal. Can't doubt that. We're, we're definitely winning the off season, so to speak, except up until like the last week when uh, he who will not be named kind of just left us high and dry. <laughs> uh, can we expect the offense to take a leap in 2024? Um, is there any realistic expectations um, after last year's, I don't want to say dreadful performance, but let's be polite and say, uh, I don't know, subpar, so to speak. It, it was dreadful, Jeff. It was dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many, how many turnovers was 16 interceptions and 15 fumbles, <laughs> lost fumbles or something. I lost count after a while. Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> I think 31 turnovers, I might be off one or two there, but uh, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, that's, you, you got to take care of the ball. That's one thing. If you can do that, you know, you've already taken a step forward, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of excitement about Dylan Raiola, obviously, um, because of all the attention that he got during the recruitment and his commitment and then decommitment to Georgia, come to Nebraska. Um, I think that, uh, realistically he has to emerge as the quarterback you know you if you don't bring in somebody that's that publicized and then he ends up backing up you know i think that you bring him in to to be a starter um but that's putting a lot on a freshman regardless of talent um and uh so i look for i i believe that there will be competition in the spring kalen uh harburg and Riola but I expect Raiola to emerge. I think at some point, uh, Harburg may end up being a tight end. You know, I, I just, I don't know how that's going to go. Um, it, he's the kind of guy, he's the got the attitude that whatever you need, that's what I'm going to do. He really does. That's what I've seen from him. Um, but anyway, I think it starts with the quarterback, obviously. And if it starts with the quarterback, it better be the guys up front that take care of the business. Uh, in order for that quarterback to be successful. And that's where I'm, you know, the, the thing that I always bring up is I'll be interested to see in the spring how that offensive line develops because they've got guys there. They've got some experience there. And uh, how is that going to translate into the protection and opening the holes for the running game? Because you got to be able to run the ball in the Big Ten, uh, even though Ryola's strength is is throwing. Let's see. Um well, you kind of answered one of my questions I was going to ask you, but I, I might skip to it and pivot back to another one since you're talking about Rayola anyways. Um, I think when I watch football, at least for me personally, sometimes I get lost in the sauce of college football, college athletics, and being a fan. But I do forget that these are, I don't want to say kids, but they are young adults. They got helmets on and you just don't see who they actually are. And so I kind of remember when I was 18 years old, my mindset and the things that I was up to um, – I don't think I can handle anything like this, obviously. And so part of my question is, is is that too much pressure to be putting on Dylan this early on? But I think you kind of alluded to it, that he's the guy and he's just got to be able to, to handle that pressure if I'm following you here. Is that right? Yeah, I think he needs to handle the pressure. I think he can handle the pressure because of everything that's been written and said about him to this point, you know, the, yep. during his high school career and, and the transfers, you know, he's played for different high schools and so forth. Um, he's been, been able to adjust uh, all the recruiting attention. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, the recruiting attention that he's received, um, how he's shown in, in camps and so forth. And, you know, as we as I said earlier, um, part of the community, he's, he's around. He's at events. You see him and you see him um, signing autographs and, and, and interacting with fans. I, I think he has the maturity that uh, I wouldn't have had at that age uh, in any effect, you know, in any way, but, but I think that he does, I think it's part of the times. It's what you have to do in order to have the kind of rating that he had and the for recruiting sure. attention that he had. And, and the money that goes along with it now. Oh too, yes. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the only other thing, quick question about the offense before we move on is um, 
and you are you're pretty good at answering questions before we even think about them. So uh, you've done your seasoned vet for sure. But I was going to ask you what you think Coach Rule wants this offense to be long term. But you said that you know Dylan's his strong suit is throwing the ball. You want the guys up front to be strong and protect him. You got any more thoughts on what you what Coach Rule probably wants this offense to be like over the long? You got to be able to run the ball first and foremost, I think, in the in the Big Ten, and then you know that open or the Big Eighteen or whatever it is, um, and that opens up opportunities for quarterback that can throw the ball. If if you're able to establish a running game, and again that falls on the offensive line getting the job done. Um, if you can get that running game going, then that makes the passing game work. And gotcha. you know you've got Riola, and I think you've got some receivers. Um, that can get the job done. Uh, I like the fact that sometimes they line up with a fullback. Um, I like the way they utilize tight ends because you're not just throwing to the wide receivers, you're throwing to the tight ends as well. And you've got tight ends that could catch the ball. So um, I think it starts with the running game, but uh, it opens up for the pass. Great. Good. Info. Awesome. Well, well, as a defensive guy and a former defensive tackle, at least in high school, uh, uh, switching hey, gears over to the black shirts, pass, Mike. Matthew. What's that? I said a damn good one at that, Matthew. Oh, you're kind. You're <laughs> kind. Well, switching gears to the other side of the black shirts, um, certainly some optimism with with Tony White back and locking him up for hopefully at least at least another year, but hopefully longer. Um Maybe a couple areas of concern. You know, we lost a couple of major key contributors uh, with Luke Reimer and Nick Henrich uh, at the linebacker spots. Uh, you know, maybe shoring up some of the third down defense. But overall, I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the defense having a similar year, maybe even improving on last year's performance. Um, Mike, from your from your perspective. Do you think the defense can 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 repeat upon that or maybe even get a little bit better than they were last year? I think it can get a little bit better because I think that the familiarity with the 335 and the players that are returning it is a positive. You know, you got Huttmaker, um, you got Robinson, uh, Jamari Butler. I mean, you you've got some talent. Uh, uh, Bullock as a linebacker. Um, you got a lot of guys in the secondary. You got Luke Gifford, your re leading uh, tackler, returning. Uh, I think Javen uh, Wright was the second leading tackler last season, or at least tied for second. Um, so you've got him. I think you've got the pieces and that experience and that defense. And, of course, you know, now the Big Ten is going to be more familiar with what you're doing because they've seen it too. But I, but I think it's to your advantage that these guys have seen this defense. They've played in this defense. They understand. And, and the positive from the defensive standpoint from a year ago, I think, is um, they got a lot of guys in there. They were able to rotate guys in that have to, some experience that is going to make this defense, I think, at least as good as it was last year and probably better. Um, and it's, it's helped by, the, uh, by an offense that has improved because you're not always going right back on the field to do something. So, I, you know, I look for something positive uh, in, in terms of whether the defense is a better. I think it'll be a little bit better because of those things. Familiarity with the system and an offense that's going to be a more productive and not constantly put you on back on the field with turnovers. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, if, if you had to nit nitpick anything on the defense, whether it be one level of the defense up front or – or the guys in linebacker secondary, if you had to nitpick anything, what would be one, one area that you're a little bit concerned about for the defense, if you have any? Well, um, probably the one area of uncertainty for me is who does step in there at linebacker. Um, you know, and again, uh, you got Bullock, um, who was effectively a starter last season coming mm -hmm. back. Um, but uh, who fills in that other position? I think there are guys that can do it. Um, and it's important. That's that's a critical area there, obviously. But for me, it's like offense. It starts up front. And, you know, they've got some good guys up front. That's going to make Nebraska tough with those guys. Absolutely. We're, cer we're certainly in love with uh, the the duo of Ty Robinson and, and Nash Huttmacher, the, the, the uh, 
two big fellas up front. But, you know, that's a, and one thing we, can, we kind of touched on in our spring football preview was, you know, the linebacker, somebody's got to fill in. But we've got some pretty tremendous athletes. And I know you mentioned Javen Wright. And I know there's there's going to be guys that are going to be just flying around to the ball. So hopefully somebody can – somebody in addition to Wright can step up and make some more tackles. <clears throat> Yeah, kind of a kind of a big picture, bigger picture question for you, Mike. You know, and you kind of hinted, you've seen, you know, you mentioned the Big 18 or or whatever we are in the Big Ten now. You know, the college football landscape continues to just change rapidly, and you know, it's kind of a, kind of bad timing the last ten years for the Huskers to have their worst stretch of football in 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 maybe since the fifties. Um, cause we're at the moment, at the moment now we're chasing relevance. We're chasing bowl games. We're chasing, you know, just get us in the top 25. Right. Um, let's say Matt rule gets this thing really humming again, you know, and, and back to, um, you know, back to what Husker fans sort of expect, you know, and I, I think that like chasing the pinnacle of what we were at in the nineties is, is always something that we should be doing, but we also need to have a dose of realism, at least, you know, before we get at that point so in this in this new world of playing not just iowa and wisconsin and occasionally iowa uh, ohio state and michigan every year but now oregon usc you know lord knows notre dame gonna get added is somebody else gonna who knows what the future is gonna bring what's a reasonable what expectations don't don't go there jeff don't even try it (laughs) sorry mike (laughs) jeff's our in jeff's our in-house Half Nebraska, half Notre Dame fan. I don't know why I brought up Notre Dame because I knew that was going to get a reaction from Jeff. They'll um, be just fine, TJ. So... Don't worry about Notre Dame. Just stay on top. They'll be fine. Uh, anyway, so what's it like? What's a reasonable expectation, or what? What like what? What can, what should common fans you know expect if, if Matt Rule can get this thing humming? Is it is it competing for the conference title every year? You know, even ten and two or nine and three might get you to the playoff in the new world of college football. So, you know, kind of what do you what do you think uh, we can hope and expect to get back to at some point if if Rule figures this thing out? Well, I think that realistically, you know, what what happened in the Osborne and Devaney era is not going to happen. I mean, if you look at Tom's uh, twenty five seasons as head coach. And I'm not saying this at the end of every one of those seasons, but during at some point during the majority of those seasons, Nebraska was in a position where it might have been a national title contender because it was always consistently ranked in the top ten. And uh, you know, you, you can you saw the games where it didn't work out, where Nebraska came up short against Clemson in the bowl game, against Miami in a bowl game you know, uh, Florida State in a bowl game. There, there were opportunities even at the end of the season for Nebraska. I don't think that you're going to be in a position where you can p- compete for national championship every year because I think times have changed. And, uh, you know, NIL, transfer portal, all these things, you have to negotiate these things in order to be successful. But I think that, you know, and it's still a step-by-step process, and that's where it gets – a little uncomfortable for fans because they're so passionate. It's like, I remember back when Bill Callahan was hired, uh, when they let Franks go, which I didn't think they should. Um, uh, and people were saying, well, you know, Alabama had a down swing and, and uh, uh, Oklahoma had a down swing and all, you know, these programs had down swings. Um, so Nebraska, we had a down swing the first year that Callahan was here. They were, you know, five and seven or whatever. Um, so there's the downswing, you know, let's go now. Let's go right back up to the consistent in the top 10 rankings. And it just, you know, it didn't happen. Um, and it kind of faltered from there. But when Bo Pelini was the coach, Nebraska always won at least nine games and, and played in a bowl. Okay. Unfortunately, there were some really bad losses in there. Yeah. And and Bo didn't uh, always distinguish himself in the way he did things. Although I think uh, people mis misread Bo in, in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, so they had nine wins in a bowl game, but people weren't happy with that. And uh, um, and so you move from that, and now things have just fallen off the cliff. So I think Matt Rule has to have some time. You know, when what he did, the turnarounds he did at Temple and. Baylor took what 
three, three years in the third year is when he really went to uh, had the remarkable success. Um, but will people be, uh, will they have the uh, just willingness to, to say, hey, uh, before we get back to consistently, I think consistently competing for the Big Ten title, although it's getting more and more difficult with addition of teams and you have to adjust and they have to adjust. How's that going to go? Um, but, you know, you have to be, there has to be a little bit of patience there with, to underscore the passion. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I guess it's been long enough now that fans are maybe starting to lose that patience. But I think there's a lot of excitement going into this season. And I think that the, you know, the schedule is set up in such a way that there's reason for excitement. I think that Nebraska is going to a bowl game this year. And uh, I think Nebraska can have a winning record this year. I think we would, uh, we, we've talked about this a lot last year too, but I mean, get us to a bowl game, any bowl game, particularly if it's, you know, seven and five or better and not just six and six. And I think all common fans are dancing in the streets in Lincoln and everywhere else that, that, uh, the common fans exist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think they can win eight games, but uh, yeah. me too. I, I would get, uh, I, I would be, I would be reluctant to just get too carried away saying that. But, but <laughs> yeah. you know, well, I, was, I think it's possible. I've been, I've been saying, Mike, eight, eight and four in 2024 has just such a nice ring to it. I mean, it's, it does. so it's got, it's an election year. So, I mean, that kind of has that, that kind of election kind of, Eight and four slogan. in 2024. Yeah, right. That's our slogan. Love <laughs> it. That's beautiful. Even though at the end of last season, I thought they were in a position where they could have gone to a bowl too. And the, uh, kind of we all out. did. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I would say most fans are pretty reasonable and patient. I mean, so if I'm reading it correctly, we're not going to shoot for a national title every year. We'll be more realistic and we'll shoot for every other year. Does that sound a little bit <laughs> more reasonable and patient? Yeah, yeah, there That's you cool. go. Uh, Great. And it works. We're, we're talking about now when we get down the line, Notre Dame's going to be in the big, <laughs> the big twenty, and uh, and, and I'll have to hide in my basement when they have to play Nebraska every few years. That's the program that the conference needs to have. I think that's that's the one, and I think, I think it'd be fun too. I mean, it'd be stressful for me, but I think it would be awesome. You can I handle it, Jeff. You're a big boy. I think I can handle it too. You're right, Matt. Thank you. I will say of the stadiums I've ever been to, and I don't travel to road games anymore, but of the stadiums I've, I've been to over time, uh, in the regular season, certainly Notre Dame Stadium was uh, was the, ranked among the best. I've been I mean, there I, once. I went, I went to USC. Really I went to the USC Notre Dame game in 2017, and it was a sight to behold. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, it is, it is great. When I went there, there weren't any advertisements or anything. I mean, it was just a football stadium. Yeah. May have changed now, but yeah, you don't see that too often anymore. Yeah. No, I know I can see the rage in TJ's eyes right now that we're talking about nerding football on a Nebraska <laughs> podcast. So, I don't know. Just yeah, uh, to pivot here, uh, Mike, I, I told you we win the off season quite frequently, um, and we were doing pretty damn well this year as far as um, transfers out of the portal, different recruits. Um, but eventually, like every off season, we do occasionally take that random L out of nowhere. So again, he who will not be named left us high and dry and scrambling. And so with the addition of our new athletic director, Troy Dannon, um, which side note, by the way, I kind of feel bad for Washington right now. They come off of a national title appearance and they lose both their coach and their athletic director. Um, but we'll take him. So he's introduced as our AD. Uh, what's your impression of him so far? Um, very energetic and, you know, says the right things. I, I like the uh, give a darn factor that he talked about. And I like the uh, image that he used of uh, the athletic director driving the snow plow ahead of the, ahead of the coaches and getting rid of the, getting rid of whatever it is that was in their way. Uh, plowing it away so that they could accomplish what they needed to accomplish because that to me that's kind of the bottom line he's not coaching these teams he's he, he's giving the support to the coaches to allow them to do what they have to do so you know if, what their needs are he tries to fill them as athletic director that's his 
point of view, uh, making connection with people outside the athletic department uh, in the uh, academic administration, making that connection, those kinds of things. So, you know, my impression is, yeah, he's got the right idea. He's driving that snowplow. He's moving those things out of the way. And, uh, you know, you can't ask for any, any more, in my opinion. Um, plus, he's got, you know, on that uh, NCAA committee, uh, competition committee uh, for four years, he's got those kinds of connections and insight that I think is really important to the position. Um, so I think it's a positive uh, hire, although, you know, it was like he left Tulane, he went to Washington, and he wasn't in Washington for, what, seven months or eight months? Um, and, and then he leaves to come to Nebraska. So people were getting on uh, – Trev, oh, you didn't want to say that, the un, unnamed. Um, uh, we're getting on him. Appreciate but, that. Uh, you know, it, it's what happens. It, it's it's the business, and it's not any different uh, for him than it is for anybody else. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one quote that stood out to us, Mike, was uh, not surprisingly uh, about Matt Rule. And Troy Dannon said, quote, put that guy in this gold mine and great things are going to happen, unquote. Um, I think we kind of have an idea of what he meant by that. But um, do you have any thoughts on that quote that he said about about this being a gold mine? Well, I think, you know, um, one thing that's kind of off the field, but it's significant, I think, is that the Nebraska Athletic Department is financially independent of the of the university in the sense that it generates its own revenue um, and doesn't have to take money from the academic side of the university which most schools do I think that's a that's that's part of it I think the the facilities you know that 165 million dollar thing that they've added there that uh, I don't know what all's in there but I you know I've seen pictures of the of the locker room and and um, you know what they've done there um, what they've made available to the student athlete, um, I think, is important. I think the uh, 1890 initiative, the NIL money thing, I think, is is a, is a solid situation for Nebraska. I think Nebraska is, is in a good position there, which you have to be in this day and age. Um, I think those th it's the things surrounding him that, that give him the opportunity, again, to, to have success on the field. You know, um, his uh, uh, line was recruit and retain. You know, recruiting and retention is important. And I think Nebraska has the ability to do that. Awesome. Well, Mike, we've kind of got your thoughts on a lot of the current affairs of, of Husker football. Uh, but on this program, you know, we're just old enough where we kind of, we, we were able to witness the, the glory days of the 90s and you know, we've heard some stories over the years of, you know, uh, of Coach Devaney and Coach Osborne. Um, you covering Husker athletics for 47 years, uh, we would love to get some some thoughts or stories or um, kind of one thing I was curious about is if you've got a few favorite kind of favorite Husker personalities that you've covered over the years. I know that's a long span of time to uh, you probably got. Uh, all kinds of thoughts and stories and, and players and coaches that uh, that you remember certain stories or certain things happening. But do you have any any uh, maybe a, a couple stories or or players that uh, that did that, you know, kind of had an interesting personality or did something kind of funny that, that you might be able to share with us? Um, you know, there it's there are so many players that. That probably would fit that. Um, here's one thing that I've said, and, and, and I'm sincere about this. Um, it didn't take long for me to realize that the games weren't the most important thing when I'm covering uh, Nebraska athletics, even though it was like, you know, the first time I'm sitting up in the press box, it's like, you know, this is great. I've got a basically a 50 yard line seat for these games, you know, and I always tried to be objective. I never wore red or, you know, whatever. Um, but, but it didn't take long for me to realize that, I enjoy this and I've continued to enjoy this and do this for as many years as I can because of the people that are involved. And then that includes the fans, that includes the administration, that includes the athletic directors, that includes the players, it includes all the people that are involved in this thing. If it weren't for that, I would have quit doing this a long time ago. 
um, because the games are kind of secondary to me, you know. Um, I'll give you an example of one player. I don't know if a lot of people remember him, but Rod Horn. He was a defensive tackle. He was from California. He's a big 265 maybe, um, 6'4", something like that. And uh, my son was, I forget what how old he was in elementary school. And I took him to practice one day, which – you could do then, you know, Tom didn't care um, as long as you stayed out of the way or whatever. And my son, Chad, saw Rod Horn going after practice, heading to the locker room. And, and I think Rod stopped and said hi to him or something. And uh, so like a couple of days later in, in class, he drew a picture of Rod Horn beside a mini tree. Like here's a tree and then here's a huge Rod <laughs> Horn thing. <laughs> Uh, so, so I I took the picture and I gave it to Rod Horn after practice one day, and he said, uh, "When is your son's birthday?" And I told him, and he said, uh, "Okay," and that was the end of it. So then uh, I think it was this was before his senior year or after his senior year, he contacts me. My son's birthday is in May. He contacts me and he says, hey, would you mind if I came to Chad's birthday party just to say hi? No, that'd be fine. So Rod Horn shows up <laughs> at the birthday party and kids are hanging on his arms and, you know, it's and he he brought something for Chad. I forget what it was, um, but he always he always stayed connected with Chad when he was playing with the Bengals. He, uh, one time he brought Chad back a football, Bengals football, um, gave wow. it to him. and, uh, you know, there, there were those, those kind of people, you know, that's what made me think of it. Roger Craig, um, my daughter was, uh, we were going into the park one day and she almost got hit by a car, um, cause she dashed out there. She's younger than my son, but it, 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 she didn't, it was okay. I mean, and she, she kind of fell down or whatever. And Roger Craig, like a couple of days later, I get a, a deal. We get a deal from Roger Craig uh, signed to my daughter, Roger Craig. It was a recruiting guide, I think, and said, I hope everything's okay or whatever. Roger Craig did that. You know, wow. I think that the, the athletic director told him uh, that it had happened, but, or, you know, somebody in the football office had said that, but um, you know, what, and so I've made some, maintained some contact with Roger Craig. Broderick Thomas was one of my uh, favorite people. Now, the I Sandman, a, yeah. yeah. The Sandman, the master of disaster. Um, I think I was one of the first people to interview him when he was throwing out these nicknames, you know, the master <laughs> of disaster. And, you know, I, I always thought that uh, uh, a turning point in Nebraska's quest for national championship was the arrival of Broderick and Steve Taylor in particular, because they talked about, they talked about, you know, it was Broderick that nicknamed uh, Memorial Stadium, our house. And uh, Oklahoma came in there and beat them in our house. <laughs> um, and they weren't afraid to speak out about things. And up to that point, Tom had always said, you know, don't, you can't talk about national titles because you can't control that. All you can control is playing for a conference championship. Well, when Broderick and Steve got here, they talked about national championships. And it changed the mentality, I think. I think you had to think in those terms. And you had to be, you know, you didn't have to be as open about it as, as Broderick or, or Steve. But um, I thought that was important. I thought even though they never won a national championship, I thought they had an influence on that climb to a national title. Um yeah, but Steve Taylor, you know, he's still in town and and uh, um, a real estate uh, person, I think, and hear him on the radio once in a while. Uh, there, there were just a lot of guys that that uh, Mike Rozier, um, really a, a a great guy in addition to Heisman Trophy winner, you know, Michael Heisman. Uh, uh, it just just you name them almost anybody and it, it you know it was they were uh, good people as well as as uh, outstanding players and and uh, that was one thing that tom osborne did that uh, 
you know, probably didn't get as much credit for as, as you would think, is that he brought in recruiting classes based on what Nebraska needed. And it didn't always have to be some high profile guy. It had to be somebody that fit the program, that fit the fit the offense or that fit the defense. You, you didn't just recruit. And I think one of the coaches that, that I thought did that was Bill Callahan. He just came in and recruited. You know, it didn't, and, and sometimes the guys just didn't fit the system or whatever. They were always highly regarded. He had a lot of transfers too, junior college transfers they brought in. But I think Tom would recruit for specific needs and get guys that fit positions. And, uh, and that's why he was successful. And they were, they were, for the most part, I think, good people. Yeah, and I think, you know, we're, a- we're, we're drink, totally drinking the rule aid right now, but it, it feels like Matt Rule is kind of handling things a similar way. Um, you know, kind of getting a core of guys that are willing to work hard and put in the time. And, uh, you know, his I loved his whole, I don't know if he's going to do it every year, but I loved his whole OOU, one of us mantra, his whole, that whole thing. And uh, so hopefully they can kind of uh, follow the kind of that same blueprint because I'm, I'm with you 100%. And there's, we've had some really great, really great guys over the years and great people. And I think that's that definitely is good for the program and helps us be successful, too. I've got to ask you, Mike, you mentioned at the beginning or you referenced at the beginning a story about Coach Osborne pulling you aside. Um, I've got to ask you what that was about. Okay, I've told this story a lot, but the, it was uh, it was the uh, uh, first year I was here. And I started like one month before the Alabama game in Birmingham, 1978. So... You know, my first day on the job, we went to Kansas City for the uh, coaches thing. And then I think the Skyriders tour was after that. And, and uh, two weeks two weeks before the game, there was a, a scrimmage in uh, Memorial Stadium. And afterwards, and we could go to the scrimmages. And we were there. We watched the scrimmage. After the scrimmage, uh, Tom took everybody into the south end zone. And he, he said to the defense, uh, one of the things was uh, – if you play defense the way you did today, Alabama will be lucky to score more than a touchdown against you. And uh, so I wrote that in the paper in my story uh, the next day. And Nebraska went down and, you know, lost that game decisively. I mean, it was, what, 20 to 3, something like that. And uh, uh, Tom Sorley uh, wore EJ Jr. like a jersey. <laughs> EJ Jr. was always getting in there. So on the Monday after the game, uh, the extra point club luncheon, and I, I have to cover it because I'm the new guy on the staff, and the Journal and the Star were separate, but they had one sports staff. So the Journal always wanted, you know, they didn't get the morning stuff, uh, which was always when the news was breaking, but they wanted something. So they said, you have to get to the luncheon, wait for it to be over with, come back and write a story for the for the city edition of the afternoon paper. Okay, so I had to get over there, get back, get that story written and filed. So we go in there and and it was the same, you know, always that Tom would speak about the previous game and the upcoming opponent. Then they would have a grad assistant give a scouting report on the upcoming opponent. And then they would have an assistant coach show film of of the previous game and make comments about the film. So George Darlington is the is the assistant coach that does the uh, third one of those things. He's going to show the film, and he gets up there before they start the film, and he said, "I'm not going to show this film until a certain sports writer gets out of here, because he cost us the Alabama game." And they kind of look around, and uh, I'm the only one sitting at this particular table. He didn't name me, and there's it seemed to me like a long pause. It wasn't that long, I suppose. And he said, "Okay." Um, I'll show the film if this certain reporter doesn't quote anything I say. Okay, so I'm thinking, here's my dream job. Two weeks in, I'm done. You know, <laughs> it <was> nice <laughs> while it lasted. Uh, uh, so I go back to the newspaper after all it's over with, and I file my story, and I go to practice. And after practice, or at practice, uh, when uh, we talked to Tom afterward in his post-practice thing, he says, uh, he said, Mike, I'd like to talk to you when we're done here. And I, I said, okay. I said, here, 
here it comes. Uh, and so he uh, talks to all of us, answers our questions, and he takes me aside and he said, you know, uh, Mike, you're new on the job. And he said, you don't understand the, the rules. He said, I let you come to practice. Um, you can watch practice. You can listen to what we say afterwards, but you can't uh, quote anything I say and you can't uh, make any comments about what happens in practice. Um, you can ask me about those things and I'll either answer your question or I won't. But since you're new on the job, that's, that's all he said. Okay. So I uh, thought, man, that, you know, that was great. And I think it spoke a lot about Osborne. Um, but, you know, here it is. I've cost him, he's 255, 49, and three. And one of those 49 losses is on me already. I did something. <laughs> Kansas, Kansas State, Oklahoma State never did. And I've only been on the job for a month. <laughs> wow. so the next day after practice, Lance Van Zan was a crusty old defensive coordinator. He comes over to me before we talk to Tommy. He says, Mike, I want to see you in your, my office when this practice is over. And I thought, holy mackerel, Lance was <laughs> Tom was good, but this is not going to be good. So I get done doing the interviews with Tom, and I go up to Lance's office, and he says, sit down, take a chair, sit down. So I do, and, and – uh, I think Dave Gillespie or one of the assistants sticks his head in and in the door and Lance says, shut the door and get out of here, you know, <laughs> whatever. So I'm sitting there and he's looking at me and the doors closed. And he said, uh, essentially he said, you know, um, on this job, he said, you have to do what you think is right. And as long as you do what you think is right, you'll be fine. That's all he said. So, Tom and Lance Van Zandt, I thought, reflected what Tom was all about and how he did things. And, I, you know, George and I uh, connected uh, later, but uh, uh, he thought I cost him that Alabama game. But, you know, Tom, you know, he, he could have been upset that I quoted him, um, but he said, you know, you didn't know the rules. So um, now you do. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. That's so cool. Um, Mike, we'll wrap up here in a minute, but I did have one last question. Um, you know, you, you went and saw a game or you actually visited Notre Dame stadium in South Bend. And that is the pinnacle of in-person college football. So that's going to be pretty hard to top, but if you could choose one, is there a most memorable Nebraska football game that you've seen in person? Most memorable football game that I've, Nebraska game that I saw, and I'm excluding the national championship games and, you know, whatever, okay. was, again, for me, because I grew up with it, was the first Nebraska-Oklahoma game I went to in 1978, because I grew up with that with that uh, rivalry. Um, I remember uh, when uh, Devaney's team in, what year was it, 62, I think it was his first season. Uh, no, it wasn't the first season. Yeah, it was. First season, I think they lost to Oklahoma like 34 to 6 or 34 to 7. And that game was on the uh, big screen at Pershing Auditorium, like closed circuit. Um, <laughs> went down there to see that game. Uh, was disappointed in how it came out. But um, so anyway, the opportunity to actually be at a game, a Nebraska Oklahoma game, and then to have Nebraska win the game. Yeah. 14, Oklahoma fumbles nine times, loses six. You know, and, and uh, Governor Jim Pillen was in on the fumble recovery at the one, uh, uh, oh, who was the guy that, uh, not uh, the great running back. Was it Billy Sims? Was Yeah, Billy Sims. Uh, it, he lost a fumble at the, about the three-yard line with the uh, time running out or whatever, and Nebraska recovered the ball. Um, that was the most memorable game. Uh, I know it was a cold day, and and whatever, but, uh, you know, and, it would, and put Nebraska in a position to win, play for national championship, and then the next week they lose to Missouri. And uh, <laughs> they play a rematch with Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl, which at that time, you didn't see rematches. That was really weird. You know, why, why did they have to play them again? And they lost that game, of course. But, um, yeah, yeah that, that's, that is easily my most memorable game. And then, you know, the first, Tom's first national championship, I remember um, 
after that game was over, waiting outside for a car to take us back to the hotel, and it was pretty late because we'd filed stories or whatever, and looking at the stadium outside and whatever, and thinking, you know, you have to treat every game as if it might be the last one you cover, you know, so appreciate it. And uh, so I took that attitude as well. But uh, it all came down to people for me. Awesome. Well, Mike, you've been more than generous with your time. We might have to have you back occasionally just to tell stories. Is that like, you know, <laughs> just to tell oh, yeah. Husker stories. This has just been fantastic. I can well, tell you a story about the time uh, Matt, I fell down in front of Tom Osborne's car, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we'll want to hear that one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I I hope he hit the brakes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yep. Matt or Jeff, you guys have any other questions? Um, I, I did, I did want to bring up, uh, I, I mentioned this to Mike before we started recording. Um, I've, I've got to, I've got to give shouts out to my, my fellow deadheads out there. So we had told him we had Jake, Jake Mule back in December and I had to bring up the Grateful Dead. So I just wanted to see what, check with Mike on Mike, if you've got any, uh, maybe one or two, uh, or three, I know it's all one song, as as Bill Walton, uh, famous deadhead Bill Walton, has always said. When people ask what's his favorite song, well, it's all one song. But do you have any, you know, one <laughs> or two favorite uh, favorite Grateful Dead songs, and live or studio? Uh, I'm willing to hear about about any of that. I like uh, Eyes of the World has always been one of my favorite ones. Um, uh, Ripple is another oh, one man. that uh, I think. What well, Ripple was the one. I think Phil Lish wrote that when his dad died. I think that was a um, why he had, why he had written that one, um, and that you know, trucking and and Casey Jones and um, you know the Working Man's Dead. I always liked that album. Oh yeah. Uh, but pretty much anything they did, uh, you know, I was I was uh, I enjoyed it. But Eyes of the World, I think, is is really a, a good one. There's no, there's no wrong answer to that question, Mike. Yeah. I just want to, I just want to hear what some, some people's favorites are. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, the legendary Mike Babcock. Thank you so much for joining us. This has just been a thoroughly enjoyable conversation. I do hope you'll come back on the on the podcast uh, occasionally, as we'd love to have you back again. Um, any final thoughts from you, Mike? Um, you know, I've exhausted my. Uh, well, no, I have no final thoughts. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I you were... appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you. Oh, Thank you for is, coming. This on. has been awesome. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, it's been a thanks thrill. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening, common fans. We'll be back at you soon. As always, GBR for life. <laughs>